Hello and welcome to another episode of A Fresh Perspective here at Heavenward Thinking. Today we're on part three of Romans chapter eight, talking about future glory. So we'll read it and we'll get right into our conversation today. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for, as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So this is a large section with a lot of uh, common things that we know in Christianity, a lot of verses that people uh, go to. What stands out to you, though? All of it. Apart from that? <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, there's just so much theology in this. There's so many argumentative points in this. There's just so much you can just get into, right? But if you're taking it from a fresh perspective, I would, I would have you consider taking it for just face value at first, right? Mm-hmm. I, I love the first part. I talked about it uh, last week. I've talked about it a lot, right? The creation groans, right? To be back to its original uh, way, right? Like, like back to its original beauty, and and it has paid a price, right? Mm. The Bible says to the one who subjected it, right? So again, when when God cast Satan, our enemy out of heaven, that had great consequences for the rest of creation, right? And he spent his time really uh, twisting, right? And and doing things to creation that it doesn't, that that it wasn't purpose to do, Mm. right? Which includes us, right? And I think sometimes, uh, you know, we we get caught up in not recognizing how much we do groan, right? We Mm. groan a ton whenever we get sick, whenever we get frustrated, whenever there's anger and hatred, and whenever we see wars and whenever we see all of these different things, we're groaning because that's not the way that it's supposed to be. And Paul points that out, and I think that that is super important for you and I and everybody who's listening to understand Look around you. This isn't the way that it's supposed to be. This isn't mm. the way that God created it to be. Absolutely. You know, I was uh, recently I read a book about uh, suffering and uh, death and sickness, and, and about how could a loving God allow all this stuff. And, and what I found in the book was it challenged people to not just look around the world and say, "See, there's evidence of God all in the world around us. Isn't it beautiful?" Uh, it really made people stop and think. Maybe we're giving the wrong idea. Maybe we need to look at the world and say, "Wow, it's really corrupted, really messed up. Uh, this isn't the, this isn't the way it's supposed to be." Like God made the world perfect and beautiful, and, and when we're telling people that just look around you and see God and everything. Uh, God is everywhere, and, and we can see God in the world around us. We can see, as Romans itself says, we can see his invis- invisible attributes through the things he has been creating uh, since the beginning of time. But at the same time, we need to look around and say, this isn't the way things are supposed to be. There's a future. There's a hope. Uh, there's going to be an amazing uh, restoration of God's amazing and awesome creation, uh, but it isn't that way yet. So when we we need to look around us and say, this isn't uh, this isn't our home. This world isn't our home. As Christians, we are groaning. As you said, we're groaning every day. We should be groaning. Uh, and it, it should be 
pointing us toward heaven. Our goal shouldn't be this earth and the way it is now. It should be the new heaven and the new earth. We should be longing for when Christ returns and sets everything right, as this uh, whole passage is really about pointing us to that uh, rebirth of creation, that renewal of creation, when things are going to be made right. Uh, so as Christians, we need to make sure that we're always pointing uh, people heavenward, always pointing people to that future glory and not getting lost in the uh, struggles and the suffering of this uh, current world and the, and the current state that it's in. Yeah, so whenever we go out in nature, because I love what you just said there, right? And we look at all of the beauty, right? So we see beautiful sunsets and we see beautiful mountains and valleys and all kinds of stuff, right? We look at that and that that's what Paul said, that, that ought to give us hope, right? We look at it, we say, man, as beautiful as that is, right? From a distance, when we actually start walking those places, you know, some of the best rivers, the most beautiful rivers in the world have trash along its side. Mm. They have death along it, right? Uh, they, there's all kinds of things. As you're walking out in nature, you see bones and all kinds of things that, that remind us that as beautiful as it is, death was not part of God's plan, mm. right? So anytime you see a skeletal remains, we can go and we can be excited and like what kind of animal it is that we like all the dinosaurs and all this stuff. It was not God's intent for dinosaurs and for animals to die. Mm. It was not. It, it was... It was because of sin. And so we look at that and we say, even with all the beauty, we see signs of decay. We see signs of things that are that have gone wrong. And so I love what Paul says. We've got to have hope. It gives us hope. We look at the beautiful sunset and we get hope, right? Because it's red and it's beautiful. And all of a sudden we say, hey, red sky at night, sailor's delight. Wow, it's great. It's going to be a beautiful day tomorrow. Like we look forward to things. But it's, it's convictional in nature because Paul says to us, listen, Hope isn't about what you can see. Mm. Hope is about what you can't see. And what we can't see, we wait patiently for it. And that right there is about as convictional as you can get for 99.9% .9 of people, right? Hope for a better job. We got to wait patiently for it. Hope mm. for a better family, right? It's situation. But we got to be patient for it. Hope for whatever. Be patient in it. Not very good at that. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, C.S. Lewis uh, talks about uh, that if he finds in himself a, a desire for or a longing for something uh, that nothing in the world can satisfy, then he must uh, have come to a conclusion that he was made for another world. And I think that uh, ties in very well with Romans chapter 8 here because when we're talking about groaning and we're talking about seeing death and all the things in creation that creation itself is groaning from and we see all the effects of sin, uh, that should have us longing for something that nothing in the world can satisfy because we're longing as Christians our home isn't here it's a different place it's another world it's the new heaven and the new earth to come so we need to uh, be careful as Christians that we don't just get content with the, what we see here in this world that we're making sure that we're longing each day and we're pressing towards a heavenward thinking perspective which gets us focused on heaven which gets us on the goal not this world not our current life our goal is eternal life with Jesus. So we're not playing for just fun times in this world. We have a mission, and the mission is to get everyone we can possible to heaven, to a restored relationship with Jesus. And, and that only comes through Jesus uh, that we are able to get to heaven and enjoy uh, the renewal of creation that we've talked about. So I think that's really important. It's like, super important. And, you know, Paul, he, he, he goes in and he ties, he ties it in. I like verse 26, right? Because he ties in. We have a break usually, a paragraph break there where we think it's a different thought. It's not. It's one continuous thought. It's one continuous letter, right? But Paul says in what you're saying there that like sometimes we, we look around us and we start to lose hope. How is it ever going to get any better? How's my mm -hmm. situation going to get any better? How how am I going to get better, right? This this was like in in... The time that Paul was writing this, man, there were coliseums, right? There are amphitheaters. There are places where you were getting eaten by lions, tigers, and bears. You were getting gladiators. You were getting killed left and right, put in prison. All of these kind of things, right, were happening. And people looking around. And, and imagine Paul going like, hey, you need to choose this better way. And choose some lions to go with it, right? Mm. Like you're going to get eaten for, for your choice. But it's worth it because we have a hope that there's a better place. We have a hope that there's something better here, right? Mm. But then he says in verse 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, right? So he's, it's a continued thought. But he ends it by saying, hey, we got to be patient. 
Yeah, that's not human, <laughs> right? So let, let's pray. The Spirit helps us in that weakness. We're not patient. We're not willing to wait. This is from a guy who spent years in jail. Mm. Imagine every day Paul waking up going like, today's the day when God's going to save me, right? I shouldn't be in this prayer. That's what happens, right? But but he goes on. The next sentence is, is super important because he says, we don't know what to pray for, mm. right? I don't know what to pray for in situations. I, I just want the situation to get better or to, things to go away. But we don't know what we should pray for. And that's what the that's what the Holy Spirit helps us do. Absolutely. And it's so important as Christians that we uh, address the topic of the Holy Spirit because that's a topic that a lot of Christians shy away from and don't really understand. Yeah. Uh, but the Holy Spirit is so important because he helps us in our prayers. He helps guide us and, and helps us when we study God's word. That's the Holy Spirit's job of coming and illuminating scripture and, and helping us in our prayers so that we can draw closer to the Lord and understand more of the things of the mind of Christ, which is what we're trying to do here at Heavenward Thinking. And, and like you said, it's, it's so important that we, we don't separate these two passages because I've or heard a lot of people talk about the future glory uh, and then they stop at the end there of of hoping for and waiting for with patience and then they totally break this other section off and really like to focus on uh, all things working together for good and and then maybe they'll use verse 26 as a, a talking about prayer uh, but it's so important that we keep it all together as one as it was it originally intended and see that it's just a continuation here like you yep. said it's, it's talking about yeah we have to be patient for what god's doing we have to be patient for what we hope for uh, for the new heaven, for the new earth, for the for the new things God's doing in our lives now, uh, like you said, new jobs, new uh, different avenues that God's working in our lives, new ministry opportunities, uh, whatever it is, we need to be patient for that. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. As you said, he helps us in that weakness because uh, Paul understood that we have weaknesses and that we really struggle with patience. I I'm sure he struggled with it at times. Uh, if you read his letters, there's times where he's talking about being eager for things. I'm sure he understood just as much as we do of the need for help in that weakness. You know, it's always been amazing to me that when Jesus is on the cross, right? All the things he could say. And what does he pray? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I think about that, you know, and we're always making that like just about the crucifixion. Like, oh, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But it's in general, right? Yeah. Also. And this plays right in that. There, there are times where we just don't know what we're doing. We're actually literally asking for things that God's like, that's the exact opposite of what I want. You're asking to save my job. And God's saying, I want you in a different job. You're, we're asking to have this. And God's saying, no, I got this for you. And so... And sometimes we, we're praying and, and God said, it's just, we're, we're so in despair. We're so frustrated by what's going on. We just don't know what to pray. And I think that's where God says, hey, let, let, me, let me fix this for you, right? Mm. Jesus recognized that, hey, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what to ask for. They don't know how to ask for it. Paul says there's times where that's going to happen. Then the spirit jumps in because, man, God... Jesus and the Spirit are one, so they know each other. The Spirit's like, mm, this is what he really means, right? Mm. I, I think of that all the time when we think about little kids, you know, little kids start mumbling and they start to, and, and the mom and dad will be like, oh, this is what they mean. Like, they just know whatever they're trying to say, right? They interpret for them. The, the problem with that is sometimes kids don't talk for themselves, mm. right? So again, God wants us to learn how to communicate. He wants us to learn to be able to ask the right things, right? Because again, Jesus said, whatever you ask for in my name, you're going to get it. Mm. Amen. And I think that ties in with uh, verse 28, which is the popular verse that everyone knows. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. You know, I find that interesting looking here is we start with in verse 26, not knowing what, how to pray for. Uh, but then here in verse 28, it says something that we do know. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. So while we don't know how to pray in all situations, we don't know what we're doing. As you pointed out, we, we often don't know what we're doing in life. There's something that we can know and that we do know as Christians uh, that God is going to work things together for good. Uh, this is often misquoted and it's often misused as just uh, everything in life is going to work out great for you. No matter how awful a situation is, God's just going to turn around and make it, it amazing. And, and yes, God is going to use things. Uh, we commonly look at Joseph in the Old Testament and see that uh, what man meant for evil, God worked for good. So that's important to uh, not discredit that. But at the same time, uh, we have to understand that this verse is very specific, uh, that God works all things together for good for those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. Uh, so when we're quoting this to people uh, who don't uh, love God, who aren't in a relationship with God, we need to be careful that we're not just uh, saying, oh, everything's going to work great in your life. Just totally disregard God because uh, there's a condition to this verse. You have to uh, love God and you have to be called according to his purpose. You have to be living out a life of faith in Jesus uh, to be able to claim this verse 
Yeah, I, I love what you're saying there because so many people misuse this verse all the time. Do whatever you want, God's going to make it be okay. No, that's not what he's saying. And I, I, I love that then Paul goes on, and like he just so much theology in this section, right? He goes on and finishes up with predestination. Mm. Huge problem in the church, right? But but I, I love the fact that all it simply says, if you follow the logic here is, hey, uh, God already knows who's going to come to him. Mm. Those people, he's found a way to call them. He's called them. Those people who he's called, they've responded, hmm. right? And those people that have responded, he's lifted them up, right? Like, it's just this logic thing, like God knew who was going to choose him. He, they responded to the call and, and all of these things just, like, it just happens like this. It's not that God's up in heaven going, you, not you, you, not you, you, not you. He's up in heaven going, I, I know who's going to who's gonna respond to me. I know. And so I'm calling those people. Mm. Absolutely. I think as Christians and theologians, uh, a lot of us have tried to overcomplicate uh, the whole issue of the predestination here in this, and it's split churches and whole denominations over this one thing of predestination. And I think as you made it, uh, it's it's so much simpler if you just take it for face value and you follow Paul's logic rather than trying to insert our own human understanding. Uh, we got to look at it with heavenward thinking perspective and, and not our earthly understanding. Because with our earthly understanding, we get really uh, messed up and, and we we try to put our own in interpretation on it but if we just take it as face value as you said it really is jesus and god they already know who's going to choose uh, to follow jesus it's not that god is, is saying that he, oh i want you and i don't want those people uh, no that's not how god works in, in, in Instead, his word says that he doesn't show favoritism. God does not show favoritism. Even in Romans, it says that. So it's not that God is choosing his favorites and saying, oh, I'd love to have you on my team. No, it's he already knows who's going to choose him. Uh, so we should just stop there and not complicate it and make it worse. Uh, again, as we've tried to do with a fresh perspective, we're trying to focus on what does Scripture say? How can we look at it with a heavenward thinking perspective rather than our own uh, incomplete and sometimes misguided understanding as, as human beings? Amen. Well, I hope you've uh, had a lot to think about in this episode that we've challenged you and, and brought a fresh perspective to this uh, very familiar passage and that you'll join us next time for the conclusion of Romans chapter 8 here on A Fresh Perspective on Heavenward Thinking.